Good evening, hushlings, and welcome. I present your preceptors to the underbelly of the void, the whispers of conjecture, and the known of the unknown. Thus begins the conclave of the Hush Hush Society. Ancient serpents, depart from this servant of God! Tell me your six names! We are the ones who dwell within. Greetings, Hushlings. Welcome back to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour, where each week we journey into the world of conspiratorial mysteries and dark truths. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And as always, we're joined by our altar boy, Slick Frank Sanders. Guys, what's up? Altar boy Slick Frank Sanders here for the second coming, no pun intended. Uh, I, I was, uh, I was here for the Vatican episode. Blessed be thy hushlings. Yeah. Peace be with you. Peace yeah. be with you. Peace be with you. And, and with you. And with you. Eat your crackers, boys. Mm. <laughs> Drink your Body of Christ. This week for Debriefing 29, we are ripping off the covers of The Exorcism of Annalise Mikkel. We look into the mysteries of the 23-year-old German woman who suffered from epilepsy in her teens and later diagnosed with depression. Claiming to hear voices, her family was convinced she was possessed by a demon. She underwent 67 exorcism rites before her passing, and her parents were charged with negligent homicide. But before we invert our crucifixes... Just want to remind everybody to follow us on our social medias. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And the official website of the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour, www.hushhushsociety.com. Where you can find all of our episodes, blogs, news, and drop the ever-wonderful review. You can hit us up at contact at hushhushsociety.com to discuss any topics with us or anything of the sort. And you can also purchase the drippiest of the drip, the cleanest, flyest, dapperest thread on the market at hushhushsociety.com. We promise it's the dapperest. Pull up. Check it out. Well, boys, crack open your Bibles. We're getting into it. Turn to Mikkel 39 A. Annalise Mikkel was born the 21st of September, 1952. She grew up in Bavaria, West Germany. She, like the rest of her family, was a devout Catholic. They would attend Mass twice a week. Annalise's parents, Anna and Joseph Mikkel, were always deeply religious. Before Annalise was born, her mother became disgraced by giving birth to a child before marriage. A girl they named Martha. As punishment for her sin, Anna had to wear a black veil on her wedding day. When her first legitimate child, Annalise, was born, Anna slowly but steadily began to impose on Annalise that she had to atone for her mother's sins through devout religious practice. Annalise then went on to grow up to become a very caring and kind young woman, and her religion completely encompassed and surrounded her day-to-day -day life. While in her teen years, she often would sleep on a bare stone floor in the middle of winter to suffer for the sins of drug addicts and other damned souls. That's rough. <laughs> yeah, very, very selfless. Very selfless. I guess she was really out there trying to save people. Well, at the age of 16, she experienced her first sign that something wasn't quite right. While at school, she blacked out and began to walk around dazed and disoriented in a complete trance-like state catatonic. She claimed to have no memory of the event when friends and family questioned her about it. She was sleepwalking. Yeah, essentially mm. she was just sleepwalking around at school. Well, about a year later, Annalise experienced a similar occurrence. She awoke in the middle of the night to find out that she had wet the bed. 
again dazed and entranced. Minutes later, her body went through a series of convulsions, causing her body to shake and tremor uncontrollably. Already I can tell she's faking this, and she's just upset that she pissed herself. I mean, <laughs> if I pissed the bed in the middle of the night, I'd probably wake up and shake violently. <laughs> what? <laughs> that'd, be, that'd be my first go-to. Like, fuck a towel, fuck changing the sheets. I'm not waking up my girlfriend, I'm just gonna shake violently until it dries up. Here's a little secret story. Okay? All right. Inside I'm excited. The, the history of mystery, Mike. Oh, boy. Years ago, I, uh, I had a lover. Okay. And uh, I stayed at her house one night, and I slept in her bed, very drunk. Uh, I woke up in the middle of the night, and the bed was wet. <laughs> and uh, I was still very drunk. I had pissed the bed. Oh, boy. Did you leave? So she, <laughs> no, no. So she, uh, she was there, and uh, I woke her up, and I said, "Hey, your dog pissed the bed." <laughs> <laughs> Did you really? Yeah. <laughs> she goes, "What? My dog pissed the bed?" I said, "Yeah, your dog was laying next to me, and I, I think he pissed the bed." <laughs> <laughs> it pissed the bed right underneath where you were sleeping. Yeah, right, you fucking <laughs> I eventually came clean to her because the story just didn't make sense. And um, she changed the sheets and she went downstairs and made me a sandwich. Wow. Moral <laughs> of the story, kids, don't lie to your lover. No, moral of the <laughs> story, shake violently and it'll be okay. <laughs> shake violently. <laughs> So it was after this event that Annalise visited a neurologist. She was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy, a disorder that causes seizures, loss of memory, and experiencing visual and auditory hallucinations. See, that shit is scary. When it comes to, like, your brain turning on you, that's fucked up. I've had times in my life where, like, maybe you're down in the basement, you know, when you're younger, and you're like, oh, I gotta run up the stairs because it's scary. That still happens um, to me. <laughs> it's yeah, like right? the scene from Home Alone with the, the furnace. Yeah, with the furnace, exactly. <laughs> except every time I went into the basement, <laughs> you're like, oh shit, fucking scared. Did I hear something? When in reality, it's just your feet creaking beneath you as you run up, your little fat boy body. It's like schizophrenia on steroids because it has this physical aspect to it that you can't control. It is super scary, though, how your mind can turn on you like that. That's one thing that I ugh, I would never, ever wish that upon a person to have some sort of mental health issue, especially when it involves seeing and hearing things. Yeah, I agree. It's not a good way to live. That's got to be like torture on the day to day, especially when you're aware that it's happening. Well, it goes kind of into what we talked about with Debriefing 27. We talked about in Okigahara Forest how people have like a almost trance-like state to just walk to where they're going. And we talked yeah. about almost demonic things telling them to do that. So that's actually really intriguing. Annalise, after her neurologist visit, was prescribed a cocktail of anti-convulsive meds antipsychotics and mood stabilizers. Later in 1973, Annalise had enrolled to start her very first year at the University of Würzburg. So yeah, that's how you kick off your uh, freshman year, for sure. <laughs> you know what's kind of funny is when it comes down to film and cinema, when you start to watch horror movies that involve like hauntings or possession a lot of them that is kind of the trope is a young girl attending college or going to school or anything like that where she's kind of abroad away from her family yep. and that's when all the bullshit starts so it's very weird that this is and maybe maybe that's where maybe that's where a lot of these horror movies got their ideas is from real everyday accounts of craziness that's a good point. It definitely could, like, this could have contributed to that very factor. It was starting before she went to college, but this is where it, like, really starts to peak. Starts to pick up the pace. Now, Hushlings, we have to remember she was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy, also known as TLE. And it is a chronic disorder of the nervous system that has a recurrent, unprovoked focal seizures that originate in the temporal lobe of the brain and last about one to two minutes. 
and it can have a number of causes, such as head injury, stroke, brain infections, structural lesions in the brain, or tumors, and could be caused from an unknown origin. I was reading that you can get this later on in life. So normally you get diagnosed with this somewhere from your late teens to like your early 20s. So for the most part, if you're past that age, you're clear out of the water of epilepsy. But this can happen if you get a fever for too long when you're like an infant. Mm. That's called a febrile seizure. Uh, well, I'm saying, if, say you got a fever for too long when you were an infant, all of a sudden you're 20 years old and you get diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. Like it, like it, it can, triggered it. It could be from something as far away as when you were one or two. It's crazy. Very scary. Yeah, the brain is, like Mike said, frightening in certain yeah. aspects. We were just talking about focal seizures, and focal aware means that the level of consciousness is not altered during a seizure. So you can be having a seizure and not drop to the floor, not have that violent grand mal type thing. And in temporal lobe epilepsy, a focal seizure usually causes abnormal sensations only. Some of these sensations might be deja vu, a feeling that you've been here, done that. Amnesia of a single memory or a set of memories, a sudden sense of unprovoked fear and anxiety, nausea, as we stated, auditory, visual, or tactile hallucinations. Tactile hallucinations, or that sounds terrifying because that's like touching. It's one thing to like see and hear things, but when your body is feeling that sensation. Feeling that, something touching your face or something. Yeah, yeah, mm. that, oh, fuck that. Um, <laughs> Other visual distortions, disassociating behavior, and you can also have dysphoric or euphoric feelings of fear, anger, and other emotions. That all sounds terrible. Well, now that we know a little bit about Annalise, let's get into the actual said possession and exorcism. Now, although Annalise was prescribed medication, they failed to help her condition. Throughout her first year of college, her mental state rapidly plunged into darkness. She began to see the face of the devil wherever she went, and she said she heard demons whispering in her ears. That is fucking terrifying. She heard demons telling her that she was damned and she would rot in hell while she was praying. She concluded that the devil must be possessing her. Didn't the grandmother accuse it too? Oh, I'm sure. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure the grandmother was like more hardcore religious than she was, than like the rest of the family, and the grandmother was like, Say it! Satan. This early during her first year of college, it would get really intense, especially during her times and moments of worship when she would be praying, which she did religiously all the time, you know, multiple times a day. And that was the red flag that this might be more than a mental condition. This could be something demonic that was taking a hold of her just because it had that religious tie to it, that it was flaring up so heavily during times of prayer. I feel like a person who is heavily religious, if something like this is happening to them, you're already in the realm of believing something ethereal or believing something heavenly or otherwise that you're very quick to kind of say, okay, this obviously has to be the work of the devil, or this has to be the work of demons, or anything of the such. So if she's that type of religious person and deeply delving into her religion, it makes sense that her having something going on with her mental stability and her mental health, her quickly attributing that to something demonic. And it can be said with a lot of things regarding religion, but I think it's a very quick and easy, quote unquote, easy explanation for a person who is deeply religious. Imagine hearing somebody go, you're going to rot in hell, bitch. Dude, I hear that all the time. I'm not, <laughs> yeah. I'm not possessed. My wife says that to me all the time. <laughs> real quick, real, real quick side note survey. I'm a hundred percent on ghosts. 100%. I believe in them full-heartedly. I've experienced that stuff. Do you guys believe in ghosts? Yes and no. What do you mean yes and no? How is there how is there a yes and no? Well, I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but... Dave and I have spoke about this before. I believe we've even spoken about it on episodes before, but we're kind of in the same 
uh, in the same realm of belief when it comes to ghosts. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Dave. We kind of see them as maybe multi-dimensional or different time variant apparitions or entities. Understandable. Yeah. I think really what it is is, and this is my my belief, and and like I said, Dave, I think is kind of there too, that ghosts are not necessarily the souls or residue of somebody who has passed away or died, but just a, you know, a vision of someone in a different timeline. My belief on ghosts is that maybe some of them are what you're seeing, the energy of a human being, whether it be a loved one. And I think a lot of that is really driven on your own psyche. Oh, that's somebody that died that's in my family or that's a friend. Like, mm. you know, just to comfort yourself kind of psychologically. But when you're talking in like an extra dimensional thing, if it's an apparition coming into this time and space, why not show itself as a human being to not freak you the fuck out? I mean, it's scary as shit anyways, but why not freak you the fuck out even more showing its true self? It could be almost like an avatar set up. And I think Mike and I have had this conversation. Annalise became suicidal. She and her family believed that she was suffering demonic possession. A family friend arranged a pilgrimage to a sacred spring in San Damiano. This friend also became convinced that Anna was possessed due to her inability to walk past a crucifix and drink the holy water. She said it tasted bad and it hurt her to walk past crucifixes. Oh, shit. All right. Yeah. Well. See, it, here's the thing, though. Like, uh, are you getting the the holy water from, like, the big dish by the door? Because well, then that don't, one like doesn't shit. everybody put their hands on that? Yeah, it would taste like fingers. <laughs> Is this tap water? <laughs> Why does this Poland Springs taste like fingers? Oh, finger water. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. She must be possessed. <laughs> the whole not being able to walk by a crucifix thing, though. Uh... I heard she, like, hissed. I was watching something and she was like hissing at crucifixes and her boyfriend at the time was like, oh, Jesus Christ. Like he had to like get her out of like places like he actually like helped her a lot throughout and she like tried to get rid of him. Yeah. Shout out to that dude because he was being super supportive to his um, possessed girlfriend. I believe his name is Patrick. Shout out, Patrick. Due to Annalise's aggressive behavior towards crucifixes and holy water and any holy relics of that nature... The family had no choice but to seek help from the church. Initially, the Catholic Church had declined the exorcism of Annalise. Exorcism rites had not been used for centuries and were highly controversial in the age of modern medicine. As she and her family continued to beg for the church's assistance, Annalise only got worse. She became aggressive and physically violent. She actually turned to self-violence. She was harming herself. She was drinking her own urine. She was eating spiders and other insects right off the floor. She was just doing some nasty, nasty possession type stuff. She was licking her own urine off the floor. Oh, yeah. She was living Ooh, off of yeah. it. She was just drinking, off drinking of piss oh and my. eating spiders, the good nutrients. Well, she must have been on a pilgrimage with Bear Grylls. Uh, yeah. yeah. It's the only thing. Urine therapy and arachnids. Doesn't he say that you can only drink your urine once? He said you can only drink your urine once. Really? So like, uh, you, if, if you're dehydrated or you have no water, you can drink your own urine, but you can only do it once. I don't, yeah, I don't trust already that filtered. guy anymore. I don't trust him. I saw this one episode where he was like in Cambodia and he used, uh, I, and I kid you not, I'm not exaggerating, he used a grappling hook launcher to like get across a ravine and I was like, nobody surviving in Cambodia has a grapple hook launcher. <laughs> nobody has a grappling hook launcher. So I'm yeah. ordering one off of eBay right yeah, now. <laughs> I'm ordering one right now. That's really gross though. But yeah, she was just doing some putrid stuff that like yeah. definitely goes hand in hand with being possessed. Well, eventually, the McKell family met with priest Ernest Alt. Unlike the other priests they had spoken with, Alt was convinced that Annalise was suffering from demonic possession and not suffering from severe epilepsy. He urged the local bishop to allow the exorcism. And in 1976, permission was finally granted to perform the ritual. Bishop Josef Stangl gave priest Arnold Rentz permission to exorcise according to the Rutile of Romanum of 1614 under one condition. The exorcism of Annalise Mikkel had to be performed in secrecy. Ah. Mm. Oh, that smells bad. 
That smells bad. <laughs> that would be much harder in today's day and age. Back in the 70s, mm, might be able to get away with it. I wonder why they had to do it in secrecy. Is it because the ritual is just kind of like a big deal in the Catholic Church and they kind of don't want to be associated with it? Or was there something more behind it? Maybe people had previously died from it or it was the whole stigma of ritual exorcisms anyways? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea that something could have gone bad previously is a pretty good idea. That could very well be the case. But I was thinking more so, what if all else fails? And the church fails, it's going to cause people to lose faith in the Catholic church, the Catholic religion, for not being able to save their worshipers from the devil. True. Mm. What, what if mm. the exorcism doesn't go right, all of a sudden everybody knows the church can't help you. Don't call the cops, they ain't coming. <laughs> Three days after Anna's 22nd birthday, the first secret exorcism session was performed. The McKells had stopped medical treatment by this stage, relying solely upon a religious remedy. Well, there was your first fucking mistake. Happy birthday! Here's your first exorcism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You guys just had birthday cake with me the other day. Mommy made great cupcakes. Now all of a sudden you got crucifixes laying on my forehead. Yeah, and Daddy made the schnitzel. It was perfect. It was a perfect day. <laughs> Daddy, you know? Daddy made the schnitzel. Over the next 10 months, Jesus Christ... 67 of these rituals were performed, once or twice a week for about four hours. Alt and Rents would attempt to drive the demons from Anna's body. During the rituals, she would argue with the priests in demonic voices. Annalise spoke several different languages during the exorcisms. Ah, see, that is something about exorcisms that always was fucking outrageous to me. Don't they have the recording of her talking? Yes, we'll get into the court case a little bit later, a tiny bit. But they end up bringing this to court. And the prosecution is played the tapes of her exorcisms and her speaking in different languages. And the prosecution managed to dig up the fact that she did previously know the uh, two other languages in which she was speaking. I Ooh. couldn't tell you what they were. But she was speaking in two different languages, and she was taking classes for those languages in college. Well, one would be Latin. Yeah, Latin and something else, but she, she was taking courses for both of them. Take that as you will. But yeah, it's freaky nonetheless. Just because you're taking a class for a language, especially if it's your first year taking the class, odds are you're not going to be able to shout it all demonic-like fluently. And who knows what the actual subject matter of those words were. Exactly. If it's more something of a larger vocabulary needed or outdated speak, then I would, I would be a little... I'm just saying, like, the, the actual verbiage of the Latin. Yeah. Okay, you know, if yeah. it's something more, a more, a little outdated or lesser known verbiage in Latin, then that's suspect in itself. But, you know, if she's uh, being exercised and in Latin, she's like, donde esta el biblioteca? <laughs> you know, like, then, then you're, you know, then you're questioning things and you're going, well, just eh, memeing on I the don't priest. Know. She, she learned that her first week. It is very weird when they start getting into the, other languages and i know and i'm hoping that later down the line we'll get into maybe more exorcisms or maybe even demonic possessions i know maybe uh season four we um, might have something on the books but there's other cases of people speaking other languages during these possessions or exorcisms where they weren't well versed in another language and didn't know other languages there's a couple other freaky things that happen during the course of these 67 exorcism rites. Things like eating dead animals during the exorcism. She Ozzy Osbourne? Ozzy Osbourne, head off the bat, blood and all. She ate coal, just because why not? If you're going to eat spiders, you might as well eat some coal. She's a bad girl. Like hot coal? Uh, hot probably coals? not. I don't know, maybe. Probably not hot coals. Or like the, the briskets from the bag. <laughs> All of the above. She would also urinate freely and uncontrollably while she was talking with the demons which possessed her. Imagine just peeing uncontrollably. <laughs> peeing uncontrollably, speaking in Latin while taking a bite out of coal. That bitch possessed. Hmm. 
That makes me think of Hush Hush Society's very first sponsor, Depends. <laughs> Mystery Mike wears Depends all the time when he is possessed by demons and freely urinates. <laughs> when he is at Depends. his ex-girlfriend's house peeing in her bed. Yeah. <laughs> you guys will never let that go. Nope. No, no, nope. just like my shit pipe story. Yep. You got a pee story. I got a shit pipe. Story. Mine's yeah. coming next season. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. Mine's season coming. four. Yeah, season four. Hushlings will return after this short message. Greetings, hushlings. I'm Declassified D. I'm Slick Frank Sanders. And I'm Mystery Mike. Join the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour Tuesday. August 17th for Debriefing 30 in our one-year anniversary show recorded live on Facebook. We journey back in time and revisit our first year. We delve into the mysterious and ominous New World Order, as well as explore the secrets of the Illuminati. We'll be hosting Hush Hush Trivia, giving away Hush Hush Apparel, and declassifying some exciting things for Season 4 and beyond. Come celebrate our journey together and don't forget to tune in September 7th for the premiere of Season 4, where we plug into Debriefing 31, Simulation Theory. Welcome back to the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. Annalise was convinced that she was possessed by more than six demons, just to name a few. Judas Iscariot, Lucifer, Cain, Hitler, Nero and an unnamed disgraced priest. I read a little bit about the priest. He murdered and like he was a womanizer. He was a dirtbag. But Judas, disciple of Jesus, correct? As far as I know, yes. Yeah. Lucifer, obviously. Cain was the son of Adam. And then Hitler mm. and Nero, a Roman emperor. That's some crazy shit. But here's the thing. If you were quote unquote possessed and really did present itself as an exorcism, but underlying it was some sort of mental health issue off the top of your head, if I said to you, hey, name five of the most fucked up people throughout history, fiction or nonfiction, those would be your top answers anyways. Not me. Now, it'd be a whole different thing if she was like, I'm possessed by these demons and she starts naming off some fucking wild Beelzebub and the sham wow guy. <laughs> <laughs> the slap chop guy <laughs> but if she starts naming off all these crazy unknown demon names and you go back and you look at the religious text and you're like holy shit she just named off some demon that was named in this religious text from the fucking 1100s then you'd have a case there but somebody coming out and saying i'm possessed by hitler and cain and judas it's like ugh I don't know. It's a little. Uh, is it the, too cheesy for you? Is it too cheesy? Realistically, kind but didn't of. She, didn't she speak in like the dialect of all of them? Yeah, that, that as, was the craziest thing. Yeah. Didn't she already know German? Yes. Well, tr- yeah. She was German. She's already German, so that covers Hitler. If she could speak Latin, that pretty much covers like Nero and this disgraced priest and maybe Lucifer, Cain, whatever. How many other languages did she really need to know? demon it's not like she had to write sanskrit or anything (laughs) these demons told annalise many times that she was suffering for the repercussions of her mother's sins which ties back in very well her mother had molded her to Mm. repent for her mother's sins it's just very strange that these demons are now telling her that you're suffering for your mother's sins you know sounds like child abuse to me yeah to an extent let me pose you guys with this scenario all right let's get it let's go do you think that at any point maybe annalise resented her mother and father for making her an insane religious person and she just didn't want anything to do with the church anymore she just kind of made it all up in a way to get out of sunday school or yeah uh crosses ah the the holy water Uh." oh yeah no that hurts that hurts i can't go near that oh there's a dead cat there i'll take a bite out of it and (laughs) you know i'm just gonna piss everywhere and then her mother was like we can't bring her to church yeah but it killed her i think that would work and if she didn't do it until she died oh that's my the God. trick gone too far april you know? fool i think that's a great thought and maybe that passed through her mind maybe because of the demons maybe the demons told her yeah uh, as far as i know she was doing this stuff 
on her own free will. She was born into a religious family, it's all she's ever known, and even after she left home and went to college, she was doing her prayers and she was attending church. Yeah, she was a prominent member of the church community. Yeah. Yeah, People were like, I, she's great. She's amazing. I think amazing. she was doing it on her own free will. I think she liked church. Doesn't mean she wanted to. Or maybe she went to church and people were like, you're the daughter of that whore. Aww. She was like, no. <laughs> well, in the summer of 1975, Annalise claimed she had regular visitations with the Mother Mary and told her to repent for the lost souls. Annalise agreed and plunged deeper into her demonic life. Almost everyone in her family believed Annalise has been chosen as a victim's soul to suffer for other sins. I looked into this a little bit real quick, that she actually said that she'll be okay for a while, but it's gonna come back after she saves so much of souls. See, that's weird, though. On a very strange side note, and I don't know if it's related at all, and I don't know if this stuff is based on reality or if it's fictional or non-fictional, I couldn't tell you, but I just drew a line in my head. I just watched this newer horror movie called Unholy. I don't know if either of you guys have watched that. Big old spoiler alert for the movie Unholy. Maybe like fast forward two minutes if you plan on watching it. Essentially, this deaf girl is visited by Mary and her deafness is cured. The Vatican sends people down to this little town in Alabama or wherever they are. And they're trying to figure out if it was an actual miracle of religion or if it was hoaxed so that they could like put a Mary shrine there or something. And they've got all these religious people flocking into this little town because Mary is here. And they're talking about those three children of Fatima, how they saw Mary. We We've spoken on that before. It turns out it was a demon that was disguising itself as Mother Mary and getting a shit ton of followers, a bunch of people to empower this demon. Just as we had said just a minute ago, Mother Mary was pretty much, you can come with me and die or you can stay here and suffer for the sins of people. And throughout these visits with Mother Mary, Annalise just coincidentally decided to keep going along with her demonic day-to-day life being possessed. She was already doing stuff, as we said, she was already doing stuff for other people or, quote, lost souls. Yeah. Before she was even possessed, she was doing these acts of goodwill. Like sleeping on hard marble floor. Stuff like that. She was already kind of repenting for people's sins and doing that stuff. This kind of harks back to the whole, if this is a mental illness, then of course the most religious parts of her are going to register that. Her going on with trying to save lost souls and then like reverting back to being possessed and talking about repenting for other people's sins and whatnot. It's all a little too convenient and it all slots up to being just a mental health issue really. Maybe in a sense, but when she started starving herself and not drinking water as an attempt to get rid of the demons, when she died, she basically weighed 68 pounds. That's what, it's like an eight-year-old kid, and she's a 23-year-old woman. We see mental illnesses and mental conditions that do drop people's weight, but not in the whole full circle of what we're seeing. Have you seen pictures of her, like, towards the end? Disgusting. Yeah, like... Unreal. Like, we would see more real. of that if that was a major condition. Unless she was one of those people that got that draw out of the hat where she had 60 mental conditions and they all just flourished at once. I agree with you to an extent, but where I don't is she chose not to be treated anymore. Her family chose to not have her treated anymore. So yes, we would see more of that, but the people with these mental conditions in today's society are treated for them for the most part. Yeah, these people are in therapy now. Yeah, therapy. Something that wasn't really afforded to her at the time, obviously. So yeah, maybe her parents were just, they just went the religious route. Again, that's because the medicine wasn't working. It was almost making it worse. I also don't know what it was like in the mid-70s in Germany. I couldn't tell you. It was probably awesome. Could be different from mid-70s in the United States. But she had also broken her knees. Kneel stand, kneel stand, kneel stand. Oh, uh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Over and over through the rituals, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I guess it's required through the exorcism rites. It's called genuflections. Kneeling down on one knee. Almost like you're proposing. So she's slamming her knee. Yeah, constantly on that cold concrete floor. Annalise McHale died in her home on July 1st, 1976. 
The official cause of death was malnutrition and dehydration, of course, when you stop eating and drinking. She was only 23 years old at the time. That's rough. She literally and figuratively went through hell. She also only ate insects and drank her own piss for a year, so I mean, you can only expect that's what's going to happen. Ten months. Give her a little bit more credit, all right? I thought it was giving her more credit for a year than ten months. (laughs) (laughs) 68 pounds, that's it? (laughs) Jesus. After her death, Annalise's story became a national sensation in Germany after her parents and the two priests who conducted the exorcism were charged with negligent homicide. The trial for these charges started the 30th of March in 1978. Before the court, doctors testified that Mikkel was not possessed, stating this was a psychological effect because of her strict religious upbringings and in addition to her epilepsy. There you go, Mike. During the exorcism, 42 different sessions were recorded on tape. These tapes would serve as evidence of demonic possession for the defense. During the tapes, demons could be heard arguing and even identifying themselves. Okay, that is what I mean. I've heard these tapes a few times, and some of these tapes, it almost sounds like there's two different languages arguing with each other. Yeah. So Mm. that's hard to do, especially if you're in a state of drinking piss and eating fucking cats. Can you imagine the mental effort it takes to go back and forth? You respond to somebody in French, you answer me in Spanish, and we go back and forth. That's tough. Mm. You would have to be very fluent in every one of those languages for that to happen. Yeah. But at the same time, she did have this type of epilepsy that was dissociative. Dissociative is, to my knowledge, something that is kind of like an outer body experience. If she had auditory and visual hallucinations, tactile hallucinations, coupled with epilepsy, coupled with any kind of other mental things that she was going on with, or that she was afflicted with, then... Who knows what the brain can do when it's pushed to its limit? She didn't start speaking the other languages and doing this whole back and forth with demons identifying each other until later in the exorcisms. The epilepsy, along with any of the other dissociative disorders that she had, along with the rites of the exorcism, you put all those things together with the malnutrition, with the dehydration, things piled on top of each other, on top of each other, on top of each other, maybe we don't have the best baseline for what a person can do in that state. Well, at the end of the trial, the two priests were found guilty of manslaughter, resulting from negligence, and were sentenced to six months in jail, which the courts later suspended, and three years of probation. The jury on the case demanded that the priest be fined and that the parents be found guilty, but not punished as they have suffered enough with the loss of their daughter. Bullshit. How is that? Very sad ending. How is that bullshit? They should have done time. Why? They killed Mm. her. They did not kill her. I don't know where you got this idea, Dave. I don't know where you got this idea. They didn't fix it. You know what? That brings us into final thoughts. Dave, let's hear those final yeah, thoughts that I you're about know. to delve well, into. Alrighty then. I let's talk know. about those final thoughts. Break it so, down for me. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, if they're already charged for negligent homicide, I mean, I don't know how it is in Germany in the 70s. The fact that she's compromised, she had some type of medical condition going on, whether it be physical, on top of psychological, she needed some type of aid from her family and... They went through the route of doing medication and whatever, but 67 ex I mean, I don't know what goes through these exorcism rites, but four hours, 67 of them. I mean, it sounds like a lot to go through, but I doubt she did this for attention from her parents. Like, oh, you forced me into this. I think there was definitely one something more going on because even though we don't think the names are very much significance because they're big names. If you hear your kid whose eyes are black, sunken in, hasn't eaten in days, just to the point where, like, they're alive, and Hitler starts arguing with Nero, and she's this tiny girl who's, like, (laughs) making fucking crazy noises. Yeah, I guess if you're religious, you're going to go to that. Since her family was so religious that they took that as their sole means to cure what was going on. And in our medical terms now, you're not going to treat epilepsy with exorcisms. 
So she's going through some type of state where she's having actual hallucinations and this is happening. She's definitely mentally ill. And I don't think that crucifixes and Neil Stan, Neil Stan was going to actually fix her. So the fact that she wouldn't eat, there's means and ways around that in the mid 70s. It's not like it's 1855. I think the parents should be liable for it. And I think the fact that they got off and because you lost somebody, you guys, you didn't do enough. That's my final thoughts. It makes me mad. I think they just killed off their kid because they didn't want to deal with their shit. I think you kind of get the gist of my thoughts on the whole exorcism. I think there are other exorcisms that have more outlandish things that have happened. This one in particular, her having a mental issue, her having this epilepsy and dissociative and hallucinations, I think it all kind of boiled down to she's a very religious person. Her mind just went to the most prominent thing that it could go to. If you're a super religious person and you have a mental disorder, the very first thing that you're going to go to is what's most prominent in your life. God is speaking to me or demons are speaking to me or uh, angels are speaking to me, whatever the case may be, but it's going to be something that is right there in your everyday life. And to her, praying day in and day out, going to church and performing these rites of penitence for lost souls, her mental health just dove her deeper into some sort of religious environment in her own head. I don't think that she was possessed. I think it was just mental health unchecked along with these religious rites being acted upon her and her having a background in some of these languages that she was taken. And I think there's a lot of things that just kind of line up to it being just a really bad treatment of, of a health issue. Really bad. I do agree with Dave that the parents and those priests should be held accountable. My first thought is with my kid, if he comes to me and he starts saying, Dad, I hear voices, I'm not going to automatically go and call the priests and say he's he's possessed. That's when you get some sort of professional but help. But they, they didn't immediately go to the priest. They went to a neurologist, she got a bunch of medication, and it wasn't working. We're also in the 1970s, but True. if that were to happen today, it would be a totally different thing. Okay, these medications aren't working for you, but these other ones will. Or let's try these treatments with this therapy, and there's a ton of other things that could have happened in today's age. Well, just the medications from the 90s until now are leaps and bounds. Yeah, especially with mental health. I don't think that she was possessed. I think it was just diagnosed but not followed medical mental health issue. I see where you're going with that. I agree with that. I think the only thing that's perplexing about it is if you hear the recordings, it's fucking freaky. If you've ever looked at people that have multiple personality disorder or personality detachment disorder or any of these things that produce an alternate personality within a person, you can very much hear the same things going on. A conversation going on between these personalities within their own heads, the personalities taking shapes of different people, different genders, different ethnicities. And I think when we hear things like that, especially when it comes to an exorcism and we're being told, OK, this is from an exorcism and you can hear the voices of the demons arguing with each other, then, of course, it's one of those things where you go into it and you're like, oh, yeah, I hear voices. I hear the demons yelling back and forth at each other. But if that was presented as this is a person who has multiple personality disorder or schizophrenia and you were to hear it, you'd go, oh, OK. That's a person arguing with themselves. That's a person making up voices for different quote unquote personalities in their own head. I got got. It's not necessarily the, uh, getting got. <laughs> I think it's just you see things as, as they're presented to you. Frank, final thought. Frank's final thought. Before I get into my final thought, I have a question. I have two questions for the two of you. Do you have your blindfolds? No, no, no blindfolds today. Just an answer I think the Hushlinks deserve to know. Do you guys believe in demonic possession? That's why I asked earlier about ghosts. It goes into the same conversation for me. Or alien interventions inside of that sort. So that's a whole other conversation. But, you know. but okay, do you believe in, in the religious sense of demonic possession? In the religious sense, no. 
why not if they have these reactions to religious artifacts and Bible verses in actual exorcisms, why in the religious sense, no? I don't think that they're tied to religion. I think if you look at the majority of exorcisms that are quote unquote demon possession, they follow people that were already immensely immersed within religion. Either they were people like Annalise that prayed every day and were part of the church-going life. Even if they weren't, within their own head, if their brain is telling them, you're possessed by a demon, even if you're not a religious person, automatically your brain tells you that you're you're possessed by a demon. So what do demons hate? They hate the vision of the cross. They hate going into churches. They hate holy water. They hate priests. If your brain is turning on you and telling you that you're possessed by a demon then automatically you're going to start believing things that demons would hate. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, now I have a second question. What are the odds that one day at school, your body automatically starts suffering from schizophrenia, depression, suicidal tendencies, and temporal lobe epilepsy all at the same time? Because she, she was undergoing multiple mental disorders. She also had a ton of shit happen to her, like measles, mumps, and... Up until that point, she had already run into a bunch of stuff. But also look at it this way. Why is the suicide rate for people that go into college so high? Stress. That really boils down to stress. It boils down to being away from home, feeling alienated. These are all things that can easily spark someone who already has a mental issue or a mental health issue into further spiraling into their affliction. I see what you're saying, but all of that started before she started school. I mean, it really picked up into full speed afterwards, so I totally get where you're coming from. So the epilepsy was there. But it's not like she she developed the epilepsy because of the possession. She developed the epilepsy before the possession. She had the epilepsy. So it's not like her possession caused the epilepsy. She already had that. The result of the epilepsy, I believe, was the things that possessed her to believe that she was possessed. (laughs) What I'm trying to get at is I'm rather torn with my final thought here. And normally I'm... I'm pretty firm on my, my final thought most of the times. So normally, I'm not too too torn. I can totally see both sides. Like, I'm not in complete denial that she was undergoing a full possession. I'm not in denial of that. For example, if somebody was possessed and they were experiencing these convulsions and they were experiencing seeing things and hearing things, if you went to a neurologist and told them that, of course they're going to tell you of epilepsy especially in the 70s. It could have been a misdiagnosis. It could have been. You think the doctor misdiagnosed the epilepsy? I'm saying it's a possibility. Or mis- misdiagnose, misdiagnosed the possession as epilepsy. It could very well explain as to why the medicine didn't work whatsoever. Because I'm sure that's, plenty that's of other people had epilepsy at the time and they were obviously prescribing this medication for a reason assuming that it worked most of the time if that was their go-to meds and they gave it to her and it was doing nothing yeah maybe there was other medications they could have put her on instead before they cut off the the medical supply and whatnot and the treatments i'm very torn nor do i think that people with epilepsy or any sort of mental disorder for that fact i've never heard of somebody with epilepsy starving themselves for a year or 10 months and drinking their own piss and eating coal and eating spiders and arguing with themselves in multiple languages fluently at the same time. The whole thing about the demonic names that were possessing her, I I hear where you're coming from. Those are like the go-to names that if you're going to hoax a possession or say you were possessed, of course, those are the names that you're going to go for. Kind of corny, kind of the, I don't know. I'm all over the place with it. I could see it going either way. Personally, I do believe in demonic possession, especially when you listen to those tapes and when you listen to other tapes of other exorcisms. There's no way that they're all fake and they don't all come from nowhere. Those are all based on actual, not all based on actual events, but they stem from real events. Yeah, I I could see it totally being actual mental illness gone untreated. They could have force fed her. 
They could have made her drink water. They could have tied her down and force fed her water and food, but they didn't. I also think that they were liable in her death, the parents and the priests. Regardless of mm. whether she was possessed or not, they were accountable for her health. They were taking care of her. A very, very tough debriefing. I will tell you that much. Hushlings, what do you think happened to Annalise McKell? Do you think that she was possessed by Hitler? What's well, got to be Hitler? Nine. <laughs> <laughs> or could it have been a mental health issue or something else in disguise? Let us know. Reach out to us. You can hit us up at contact at hushhushsociety.com. Hushlings, do not forget to tune in for our Season 3 and 1-year anniversary show streaming live on Facebook on Tuesday, August 17th. It will be a banger. Mark it on your calendars. Set alarms. Do what you gotta do. Do not miss it. Google Tasks. Make it happen. Yeah. For real, stop by. We would love to hear from all of you. See you in the comments. Uh, participate in the trivia. It is going to be, like Frank said, a fucking banger. Wah, wah, wah. We'll be covering the New World Order and talking about the Illuminati. As well as Mike said, Hush Hush trivia again. More giveaways of Hush Hush apparel and the ability to chat with us live. So, Hushlings, thank you again for joining the Hush Hush Society Conspiracy Hour. I'm Declassified Dave. And I'm Mystery Mike. And I'm Alter Boy Slick Frank Sanders. Peace be with you. Until our next debriefing, remember, the best kept secrets are hidden in plain sight. <laughs>